sweater that you was wearing. Well, thank you very much. I like it. But don't you mean that you are wearing? No, not you, Dr. Kim. You. Oh, you mean you. As in her. See, when you said you, I thought you meant you as in me, and not you as in uh, her. Gee whiz, is this whole show going to be this confusing? I certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be talking about yous today, right? Me's. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah. We're, we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about yous, which are? Female sheep. And rams, which are? Male sheep. And lambs which are baby sheep. And all the different kinds and breeds of sheep. And that's why we're wearing all this wool today. Does this feel hot in here? Yes, it does. It feels very warm. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. How is it that wool keeps us so warm? And how do we get the wool from the sheep to the sweaters that we wear? Kind of like how wool gets from you to you. Exactly. Plus, we're going to talk about all the different kinds of wool that we can get from all the different breeds of sheep. And then we're going to talk about how we use all those different kinds of wool and all the different kind of wool products that we have, like pants and sweaters and throws and covers and that kind of stuff. And then we're going to talk about all the other Wait kinds of products. Wait a minute. Slow down. That's an awful lot to talk about in this show. Where do we even start? You're right. It is a lot to talk about. Maybe we should start with the Gee Whiz Kids. Get cold when we take their wool. The sheep come in colors like sweaters. Black, black sheep. If they are black sheep, does that mean they are red sheep? Yellow sheep. How about plaid sheep? Is it a flock or a herd of sheep? A herd of sheep. A herd of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between a lamb and a ram? I don't know. Is a lamb a little ewe? How do you know sheep? Do the sheep get their milk from the store? Does all wool come from sheep? Why is wool so warm? Sheep I like that last question. Why is wool so warm? Well, before we can answer that question, we have to know what is wool. Wool is a fiber, and you know that fiber can come from lots of different places, right? Really? Mm-hmm. Fiber can come from plants. It can come from oil or plastic, or even from lots of different kinds of animals, like llamas, alpacas, and goats. Goats? Mm-hmm. Mohair comes from goats, and alpaca comes from alpacas. Are you saying wool comes from wool? No, wool comes from sheep. Then what's alpaca? Depends on where he's going. I don't get it. You know, what is alpaca? Where is... Oh, never mind. Alpaca is an animal that comes from South America that's very similar to the llama. Okay, so when we shear an alpaca, we get a fiber from it. And that fiber is called alpaca. And then when we take the alpaca and make it into a cloth, that cloth is also called alpaca. Is the headache I'm getting from this called alpaca too? No, you're just thinking too hard. Actually, there are lots of different kinds of animal fibers that get called wool. But wool really just comes from sheep. But there are lots of different kinds of sheep, and so we have different kinds of wool from the different kinds of sheep that result in different kinds of products. Is that why some of my sweaters say Merino and others say Shetland? That's right. Different breeds, different kinds of wool. But you know, wool isn't the only product that we get from sheep. There's lanolin, which is a byproduct of wool, and lanolin shows up in lots of things like skin lotion or creams that we put on when we burn ourselves or hurt ourselves, and lots of makeup has lanolin in it. Plus, we get sheep skins and milk and cheese from sheep. Wait a minute. You mean we milk sheep, too? Yeah, in lots of cultures around the world, they drink a lot more sheep's milk than they do cow's milk. Sheep are more important in a lot of different cultures around the world than they are here in the United States, and they drink sheep's milk. But they're so small. That's why you have to have little tiny hands to milk them. No, actually, cows are much larger than sheep, and so they produce a lot more milk. And that's one of the reasons that we have lots of cow's milk here in the United States. I wonder what it tastes like. Funny that you should ask. We have here cow's milk and sheep milk, and you can taste them. They look different. Yeah, they taste different, too. Mm. 
Don't you like it? <laughs> That's okay. A lot of people don't like the way sheep's milk taste, tastes. It's very different from cow's milk, isn't it? Yes. yes. What does it taste like? Indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, huh? Well, sheep produce milk that is very different from cow's milk. It doesn't have as much sugar. It's got more protein, and it tastes really different. And that's one reason that we don't have a lot of sheep's milk here in the United States. Don't worry, lots of people don't like it. With all those products, sheep seem pretty important. Yeah, they have been, and they've been very important throughout our history. In prehistoric times, humans hunted sheep for their meat and skin. Domesticating sheep in order to tend them in flocks provided humans with a steady supply of food and clothing. In fact, sheep are one of the oldest domesticated animals, second only to dogs. Sheep were a valuable part of ancient life. Because they could live off weeds and scrub, sheep could graze land that wouldn't support other animals. Over time, sheep were bred to produce different kinds of wool, milk, and meat, and their importance grew. A man's wealth was often counted by the number of sheep he had. As civilization grew, sheep became no less important. The production of wool was vital to England's economy before the American Revolution. English law tended to crush wool production in the colonies. The American response was the production of homespun wool by individual colonial families. Wool production's influence has been felt in many ways. Words and phrases that were originally used by people who worked with wool are now part of our everyday language. In colonial times, spinning wool into yarn was usually done by the unmarried women in the house. We still hear single women called spinsters. I know you've heard the song, Pop Goes the Weasel. A weasel, in this case, isn't an animal, but a device for measuring yarn. Every few turns, the weasel would make a popping sound to mark the yardage. Pop goes the weasel. Have you ever heard of the phrase, dyed in the wool? When wool is dyed in its natural state, before it's spun into yarn, the colors are deeper and more permanent. Today, the phrase is used to describe something that has depth and truth. And if you fleece someone, though I know you never would, that means you trick them out of money or property. In other words, to steal the clothes right off their back, much as a shepherd takes the clothes, or wool, off a sheep's back when he shears it. I had no idea sheep were so important in our history, but you still haven't answered my question. Why is wool so warm? To get the answer to that question, we better go to our roving reporter and a sheep expert. Thanks, Dr. Kim. I'm here at the sheep unit on the University of Kentucky's Cold Spring Farm to talk to Dr. Monty Chapel. <laughs> Dr. Monty Chapel is here to answer the big question once and for all. Why is wool so warm? Well, why don't you come on in and we'll talk about it. Sure. What's your step? You take this bit of wool in your hand, you'll notice as you squeeze it and releases, release it, it'll trap air. And trapping that air is an important quality in that wool is a good insulator because it traps air. In doing so, it'll maintain body temperature of the person that's wearing it, whether they're wearing mittens or a sweater or a coat. So that's really important. It's also cool, Renee, because folks in hot climates also wear wool because the wool absorbs the moisture or perspiration from their body, and that helps keep them cool. So wool is not only warm, but it's cool, too. Cool. Um, why are my fingers so sticky? Well, if we look at the way the wool fiber grows, it has lanolin on it. And you can buy lanolin not only as pure lanolin in the drugstore, but also in, in many hand creams and so forth. The wool fiber, as it grows, uh, lanolin is produced as a part of its growth. It keeps the wool from tangling. And on the outside, it makes the sheep's fleece waterproof. So it will turn water. So when these sheep are out in the rain, that water will just run right off. So are all different kinds of wool the same? Well, there's actually a variation in fiber diameter, and that's how we actually classify and grade wool. And it varies even from, sh from within an individual sheep. Probably the best and longest and finest wool on any sheep will come off this area right here. The shorter wool on, in the fleece will come off the belly of the sheep. The coarsest wool will come off 
the lower part of the rear leg. And if you look at that, we can see that that is coarser and it'll be much lower yielding because it has a lot more lanolin and wool grease in it. Okay. Now, as we move from one sheep to another, there's also a great deal of variation. The wool that you have in your hand came from what we call a fine wool sheep. And you can tell by feeling it is soft and so that the fiber is also very fine. If you look at it, it has little waves in it that we call crimp. And if you want to take that, take that and look at it, those little waves are small, and that's an indication that the fiber diameter or the size of each individual fiber is relatively small. On the other hand, if we look at this fleece of wool and look at it in terms of the crimp or the or the little wrinkles that you see in the wool fiber, you can see that they're much larger. We can actually see those pretty easily. And as you handle that, the fiber is much coarser. In fact, this particular wool would be twice as coarse, nearly twice as coarse as the fiber that you have in your hand. So we have a great deal of variation in the types of wool produced by sheep. We have the very finest, we have the coarsest wool, and then we also have sheep that only grow hair we don't have to worry about shearing those. So there is a great deal of variation in the type of fiber that sheep produce. What about all the other stuff, like man-made fibers? Is that as warm as wool? Well, as man-made fibers were developed, certainly they looked at the characteristics of wool being important to mimic in those products. And many of the fibers do have certain of those characteristics, but not all of them. Because of that, many of the man-made fibers are blended with wool so that we have the advantages of man-made fibers and also the advantage of wool at the same time. Uh, that certainly means that the folks that produce man-made fibers realize that wool is a high quality product. So wool really does keep you warm? That answers my question. I can't believe when I'm wearing a wool sweater I'm actually wearing a blanket of air. That's cool. No, that's warm. What I really want to know now is where yarn comes from. What I mean is, how does it get from the sheep to the sweater? You mean, how does it get from you to you? Now, don't start that again. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Let's watch this and see what happens. wool gets from you to you. Exactly. And that's why we say wool, you keep me warm. Very warm. But is that all there is to it? No, of course not. Here, you hold this and I'll show you. To help us put together the whole sheep picture, we're going to talk to... Hi, Hi. Dr. Kim. Hi. Hi, girl. Wait a minute. How did you do that? Sheer luck, I guess. But what are you doing here? I thought you were a cow expert, not a sheep expert. Well, I'm really well-rounded. OK, here's a well-rounded question. Do sheep eat the same way as cows? Actually, they don't. If you take a look at a sheep's mouth, it's really different from a cow's. They have much more flexible lips, so they can eat much closer to the ground, and they can be more particular about what they eat. Plus, if you give a sheep its choice, it'll eat something with a broad leaf, which we call a forb compared to grass, which has a really narrow leaf, whereas cows will prefer to eat grass. How do you keep them all together? And how do you get them all to go to the same place? Well, if you've ever seen sheep in the movies, you'll notice that they always stay together. That's because sheep are gregarious. They like to stay together. They don't like to be off by themselves. Because of that trait, one person and one dog, like this fella here, can handle a 1,000 sheep. They can work them all together, and they'll stay together because of that trait. When do you shear the sheep, and how often? Well, if you have questions about shearing, I know the perfect place for you to go. You need to go to the Kentucky State Fair. How do I get there? Well, you go down the road here, and then you take a left, and then you'll hit Louisville. OK. Uh, Aren't you coming? I got to get back to the studio. 
nice chop and company. This stunt was performed by a trained professional. Don't try it at home. Wow, I always thought that sheep were bad for the grass. A lot of people think that. We know it's sheepy, but I'd still like to know where the different kinds of wool comes from and what makes some um, soft while others are thick and scratchy. Well, that has to do with the different breeds. We should ask Renee to look at that while she's at the state fair. Hey, Renee, are you there yet? Yeah, I'm here with Kaylin Poe. He's going to tell us all about sheep. So, Kaylin, what do you like most about sheep? They're just fun to play with and fun to take care of and fun to have and everything else. <laughs> How do you take care of them? Put them in a pen like this or one bigger with a whole bunch of other sheep or any way you want to, just keep them in a pen and bed it down with some nice straw and uh, give them bucket water, um, put a feeder in and uh, you have to feed them twice a day and check their water and you're set. What kind of breed are these sheep? Uh, the black faces, the black faces with the white wool on top of their head. It's called a Hampshire. This guy was born this year. He's a ram lamb. Um, he's a Hampshire. Hey. And uh, I named him. His name is Diesel. And the white ones like those and those over there are called Columbias. The Hampshires are a meat breed and the Columbias are a wool breed. The Columbias are white. These are black face, black ear, and black legs. And the Columbias, they have very nice fleece, wool, whatever you want to call it. And uh, after you shear that, it makes a real nice spin. What do you do with the fleece after you shear the sheep? Take the sheep, you put him on a shearing floor, you shear him down. You bag up the wool in these great big bags. You sell it to a wool company. And they'll sell it to spinners, and they'll dye it, and they'll spin it. socks and sweaters and whatever. You know how this breed, um, you take the meat out of it? Do you also use the wool as well? Yeah. You can do that. Uh, they use the wool off of every breed. Every single breed they use the wool off of. But they also have really good meat. So you, you call them meat breeds and wool breeds. You can still use the wool off the meat breeds. How do you take the horns off? Uh, like Hampshire's, they, they only grow little stubby horns. They don't grow big ones that curl around or curl out or anything. Uh, they just grow little stubs, and they grow right there where those black spots are. You can feel in there, and you'll feel a little stub. And you just take them and twist them and pull them off. Is it the same way with the Colombian sheep? Colombians don't grow horns, period. Oh. So all sheep don't grow horns, right? Some of them do, and some of them don't. Uh, there's another breed of sheep called Merinos, and they grow really big horns. They curl around, and they curl out, and every which way. You don't take the horns off of them. They're supposed to have horns. Hey, Renee, have you run across any new breeds up there? There's so many breeds of sheep, I can't name them all. So just watch this. <laughs> What's that you say? A sheep is a sheep is a sheep. I say, if you wish to assist me, the world's greatest detective, you must be observant. You must be quick. And most of all, you must be quiet as we investigate the magnificent, the magnificent Merino, Merino mystery and other shocking yarns. The thread of our investigation begins centuries ago in a country we like to call Spain. There in Spain, the Merino was created. 
Spanish Merino sheep and Arabian horses are the oldest of all the pure breeds of livestock. Indeed, and so important. Why, almost all the modern breeds of sheep include Merinos in their pedigree. What's a pedigree, you ask? Another word for family tree. Merinos were created to grow excellent wool. Now, what you see here is the highest quality wool in what's known as the grease, or straight off the sheep. Excellent wool has, uh, perhaps you'd better write this down, the highest percentage shrink. That is, it's the greasiest of all the wool. Why? Well, lanolin, my dear, is very high in lanolin. Now look at the top, as we wool experts call it. Top is wool that has been scoured and combed. See how small the fibers are? And look at how many of them squeeze into a single square inch. Plus, look at the vast number of tiny waves, or crimps, in each fiber. These are points that constitute fine wool. And where do you find wool of this ilk? That's ilk, not silk. Why, from Merinos. Look here. Is that what I think it is? Why, it is! A gentle white giant. A Columbia. The first American breed. These are big-framed, well-muscled sheep who shear medium-quality fleeces. Medium-quality means their wool is less greasy, the fibers are larger, and each fiber has fewer crimps than finer wool. You see, wool quality. It's elementary. Long-wooled breeds like Romneys have heavy fleeces of low-quality wool, meaning the fibers are rather large with few crimps. Romneys are prized by hand spinners because they come in a variety of colors. How lovely. What's this? The yarn takes a twist? There are breeds that are raised for meat and not wool? Who are these meaty sheep? Why, they're some of the most popular breeds in the United States, like Suffolks and Hampshire. Suffolks are very large, heavy, and tall. They have white fleeces with medium quality wool. Their skin is quite black, as is the hair on their faces and legs. And they have no wool on their heads at all. Most striking. Look at those muscles. Why, it's the terminator of sheep. I'll be back. Hampshires are very fast growers with excellent meat qualities that make them very popular. So there you have it. The final strand in the magnificent, the magnificent Merino, Merino mystery. mystery. And other shocking yarns. So that's the story on sheep and wool and how we get wool off the sheep. Now I know why wool keeps me warm and how wool gets from you to you, but we still don't know why there are black sheep. Oh, well, there are black sheep because that's a question of genetics. Just like you have the genes for brown hair and I have the genes for red hair, there are some sheep that have the genes for white wool and some have the genes for black wool. We use that black wool when we spin. Um, hand spinners like to use dark colored wools. There's another good use for, for dark colored sheep too. Out west, when they had the big flocks of sheep, if you put one black sheep in for every hundred white sheep, then it's really easy to count your sheep. Oh, I get it. One black sheep is 100, two is 200. Exactly. So next time you're out west and you're driving around, you see a big flock of sheep, all you have to do... I just count the black ones. That's right. Cool. No, that's warm. Because, well, you keep me warm. I guess we should end today's show by thanking everybody who's helped us, like Dr. Monty Chapel, And Mr. Charlie Swain. And everyone at the State Fair. And Kalem Poe. And Renee. And you. And you. And you. You're welcome. And that's all for today's G, G Wiz and Agriculture. agriculture.